Welcome Classic Rock fans to another Top 10 Ranking video and today we're looking at terrible songs on great great albums. Uh, this list is going to start with songs that could be argued are perhaps just misplaced and work its way up to the real unflushed turds of classic rock. If you're new to this channel I urge you to click like, subscribe and check that notification bell and do stick around to the end for a few dishonourable mentions. Number 10 is Kooks by David Bowie from the wonderful Hunky Dory album. This is one that will have many of you staggering on your platform heels. But I would say for a man who not only re reinvented himself, but reinvented rock and roll on a number of occasions. But this journey from Anthony Newley wannabe to Starman was at times a brilliant, if not a little bit jarring. Everything from the kind of whimsical folk inflected uh, space oddity to the proto-metal of the man who sold the world. It certainly marked the beginning of all things weird and wonderful in the world of art rock. But for many, Hunky Dory is the jewel in the Bowie crown. It's a unique brand of ethereal pop and glam rock that would eventually mutate into uh, Bowie's most endearing alter egos. Set against tracks like Changes in Life on Mars, this one feels a bit superfluous. It feels like a bit of a throwback in many respects. It's actually an ode to his young son, uh, which makes for a rather acute idea rather than a track that warrants a place on this record. It feels like a, a bit of a throwback to Bowie's vaudevillian textures that he explored on those very, very early albums. Number nine is Darling Nikki by Prince from the wonderful Purple Rain album. Many have argued this is the most inessential track on a record of essential tracks. It's a dirty little ditty about uh, uh, a sex fiend he encountered in the hotel lobby masturbating with a magazine. Sounds like Prince probably stayed at the same branch of Premier Inn that I did. It's a bit scuzzy, this nasty piece of funk vamp would be better placed on Prince's later albums rather than the tight and dapper Purple Rain. Number eight is from Neil Young's Comes a Time and the song is Motorcycle Mama. I've often said that Neil Young makes two kinds of albums, good albums and bad albums. So it's a rarity, I think, for a, a song that's this awful to pop up on a, what I would cons consider a consistently good Neil Young album. But such is the case with Motorcycle Mama, which is a penultimate track on 1978's Comes a Time. But the rest of the album, according to one critic, is in fact a lush yet skeletal work of folky introspection laced with the homespun harmonies of Nicolette Larson. But this track is a frightful throwaway, a lopsided barroom blues jam that should not have made it onto the album. Number seven is Cars Are Cars by Paul Simon from the Hearts and Bones album, which I think came out about 1982 if I'm not mistaken. I'm a huge fan of Simon's later works. Um, I find I think he's a very experimental songwriter, and for me sometimes it, it can be very hit and miss. But this is definitely a hit, an album that essentially explores his relationship with Carrie Fisher. It's also the lost Simon and Garfunkel album. However, Cars is Cars is a gas guzzling backfire metaphor. I understand, but nevertheless, one that would have. Greta Thunberg, that uh, Swedish doom pixie frothing at the gills. This track just sounds awful, plus the analogy uh, just does not work. Cars are not all the same. Anyone who's had to navigate the by roads of East Anglia in a second-hand shitbox will know exactly what I'm talking about. As I've said, it's a song that just sounds dreadful and just doesn't work as an analogy, quite frankly. Number six is Pink Floyd and Seamus from the Metal album. For many, Metal is an incredibly important album. It sees this band moving away from the psychedelic noodling of the late 60s and putting them on a trajectory towards their conceptual masterpieces. I would argue that uh, actually Atom Heartmother is incredibly experimental, a bit clunky perhaps and clumsy, but nevertheless, it's a, that's also a remarkable album and a vital piece in the Floyd jigsaw. This track is a bit jarring, quite frankly. It's a piece of fluff with Steve Marriott's dog as the star. But you've got to consider in the age of CDs, this could have been like a whimsical, humorous throwaway added as an extra. But in the age of vinyl, when everything had to count, is this really the best they could have come up with? Not exactly a suitable precursor to the arresting ping of Echoes, is it? Number five is John Cale's Paris 1919 album and the track Macbeth. John Cale contributed so much to the, the sound of the Velvet Underground from the um, a really avant-garde experimental album, which I think is one of the most important records of all time, in my opinion, from that beautiful jangle of the Celeste to Cale's Viola. 
the John Cale's Paris 1919 album is so lush, so baroque, so very different from the avant-garde experimentation of the Velvet Underground. It feels almost hypnotic and soothing at times. Interesting, this album is actually noted for its orchestral-influenced style, drawing, I think, uh, from influences like the, the Bee Gees and Procol Harum. The title is drawn from the 1919 Paris Peace Conference, and the songs explore various aspects of early 20th century Western European culture. But this track feels out of place. It's jarring, like somebody ferociously breaking wind during a meditation session. It's an overly manic detour. One critic has likened it to finding a garlic clove in an ice cream sundae. Number four is Meeting Across the River by Bruce Springsteen from the Born to Run album. My word, this is going to have a lot of you frothing and raging. Nobody was more thrilled than I was when Springsteen announced he was playing albums in their entirety on his Wrecking Ball tour. But I found when he played the um, Born to Run album, even the most hardened Bruce Blowhards would choose this song as the perfect moment to take a piss. It just drags and meanders with that echo-drenched trumpet making it sound like uh, an old film noir. Maybe Bruce felt his audience needed a, a breather, a piss break even, between the intensity of She's the One and the epic A Jungle Land. But this song is guilty of what I would call epic overreach. It's a seriously atmospheric downtown drag. All we need is a few cat yowls and breaking bottles and my word would have a Tennessee Williams play all accompanied by this uh, soft jazz slop. Number three is Rainy Day Women, numbers 12 to 35 by Bob Dylan from the wonderful Blonde on Blonde. Blonde on Blonde is the greatest double album ever made, in my opinion, and arguably the greatest Bob album. The apotheosis of Dylan goes electric and thumbs his nose at all the clay pipe smoking folkies of the East Coast. It's sharp, observational, quick-witted, uh, all the coined from Dylan's rather pill-addled brain at this time, ushering in a kind of psychedelic permanent state of unfocus, emblematic of its cover. But this sounds like uh, just a bit of a New Orleans pastiche after smoking a little bit too much of the old jazz cabbage. Perhaps that's what he was going for, but it doesn't in any way hold up to the brilliance of the other tracks on this album. It just feels like an end of session goof. Number two is Cream and Mother's Lament from the remarkable Disraeli Gears album. This dirge-like throwaway piece of buffoonery is just pretty damn awful. Many see this um, track as the band indulging its goon influence, perhaps. Has to remember that Cream didn't actually write this song, though. However, we'd have to question why the fuck would they record it. This track is actually listed as traditional, but it's not traditional. It was actually written by Erwin Dash an American and an English songwriting duo Elton Box and Desmond Cox, writing under the collective pseudonym of Jack Spade. The original title of this track is not Mother's Lament, but When Mother Was Bathing the Baby. It was first popularised in English musical by Elsa Lanchester, who actually starred in Mary Poppins. So it's a musical song that maybe the band were just got to reminisce a little bit about their childhood. Some might say it adds a welcome break to the swirling lysergic day glow textures of this album. I just think it's bloody awful. And number one, the turd in the caviar, so to speak, is a fairly obvious choice, and that's Beatles Revolution 9. Many have long debated whether or not the White Album would have made a better single album. I, I did a video on this, so you can look it up. It's quite interesting, but uh, nevertheless, I think there's enough material there to make a, a damn good, even perfect double album. If they could have just jettisoned or flushed this one. Eight minutes long, it's the longest track in the Beatles repertoire sandwiched between Cry Baby Cry and uh, Good Night. But its length as well makes it extra punishing. And I always think if this track wasn't on this album, think of the tracks they could have put on this album that were jettisoned and how much better this record would have been. The song's defenders say it's a wonderful bit of um, avant-garde soundscaping, which might well be the case, but it does not belong on this record. It belongs on one of uh, John Lennon and Yoko's uh, odd solo albums at this time, I think. I have to say that Wild Honey Pie is pretty damn awful as well, but that only chimes in at perhaps less than a minute, mercifully. So there you are, that's my top 10 awful songs on great, great albums. Now, as promised at the beginning of this video, a few dishonourable mentions. First one is uh, the Kiss album, Love Gun. Now, some of you will say that Kiss's Love Gun is not a great album, but I rather like that uh, late 70s Kiss period between the Alive album 
and uh, before they went all disco. And Love Gun features Then She Kissed Me, which is bloody awful. And of course, the debut album featured Kissing Time, but that wasn't uh, the idea of the band. I think that was snuck on there by the band's management. Uh, next one has to be a police album, Synchronicity and the awful track Mother. I think Sting allowed this one to go on the album just to highlight how good his songwriting was. I'm also not over keen on the track Irene from the Small Faces, uh, Ogden's Nut Gone Flake. And lastly, the dreadful La La Love You by the Pixies from their Do Little album. Anyway, there you are. That's my list of uh, 10 wonderful, wonderful albums. Slightly polluted by 10 dreadful tracks. Hope you found this video interesting or at least entertaining. Do click like, subscribe, check the notification button and share this video with others you may not like so much. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope you stay well, safe, more importantly that you keep listening.